Okay, so today we're going to talk some more about the reverse addict. Let me start my timer. So I know that my timer's going and, and that gives me 10 minutes. I don't want them to be any longer. Uh, so when the alarm goes off, I know to finish. So this is the second video in the series about the reverse addict or codependence. And there'll be at least one more, probably two more. I do want you to watch the first one first because that really sort of sets the context for what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it explains what I mean by reverse addict and what you would uh, generally know as codependence, the difference and so on, so that we can understand uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. So today I'm going to be talking about patterns in families and where the idea of addiction and reverse addiction emerges. Uh, now, the sort of patterns I'm talking about, and there's two, uh, which are kind of uh, related. These patterns I've seen so often in families that I would have called them universal. Uh, before I was a Christian, uh, I would have said they were universal just because I've seen them so often. I I've seen them again and again and again. Um, but having read uh, Luke 15 and the prodigal son, uh, now I, as a Christian, you know, I would definitely call them universal because there's God actually speaking about them. And we'll get to that uh, later. But first of all, I want to describe the sort of patterns as I've seen them in my family therapy and when I'm working with families. So let's talk about the, the addict pattern first because uh, that's not what I want to stay with. We're talking about the reverse addict at the moment. But let me get the addict one out of the way because essentially um, what happens in dysfunctional families um, is any dysfunction is leaving the child uh, it, with, with two choices. Um, but before I just get to that, let me talk about dysfunction generally and what it does uh, because that sets the context for the patterns. So w when there's any dysfunction in the family, uh, all the way from mild dysfunction, which definitely includes all of us, uh, or nearly all of us, I'm sure, um, all the way up to uh, serious uh, abusive dysfunction. Um, what it does for the child is basically it draws them or drags them into the adult arena. So what it does is basically get them to make adult choices and adult behaviours uh, when they, they, they've got no uh, ability to do so. When you think about us now as adults, even though we're, we may be affected by the past and so we may have our own issues, uh, the fact is if relationships get bad, if things go wrong, then we can walk out the door. We can pack a suitcase, we can leave, we've got choices. And the important thing to remember about children as you really set the context for understanding the issues that you've got today, is that children can't leave the field of play. So let me just say that again. Children can't leave the field of play. In other words, they don't have the same choices that adults do. The psychiatrists tell us that as children we're, and babies, we're, we're perfectly aware that um, we depend totally on these adults. We're completely dependent on them because we know that if we don't please them or be accepted by them, we're going to starve to death. I mean, it's, it's that serious. We know that uh, our very lives depend on it. So the idea of leaving just doesn't come into it. We, we have to find a way of surviving whatever it is that gets thrown at us. And hence the, the patterns start to emerge. So any sort of dysfunction, the first thing you have to remember is that children have to find a way of surviving it. Now, the way they do that is they deal with the issues that are put in front of them. In other words, they have to start acting like grown-ups. The problem is they're not grown-ups and they don't know how to do it. So it's all an imitation. And that gives you a real good understanding of the context in which these patterns, these unhealthy patterns start to emerge. It's an imitation. It's an unhealthy thing. It's a survival strategy. Now, there's nothing wrong with survival strategies, of course. Why? Because they help us survive. And the thing about a survival strategy is the more basic it is, the more it's coming from the very basic brain. 
and the more uh, you still breathing at the end of the day uh, counts as a success. You know, just the fact you're still alive, that'll do it. It's a triage uh, survival strategy. And so there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're in a very, very difficult or life-threatening situation. We have to survive. That's what fight, flight, adrenaline, freeze, it's what it's all about. But the difficulty comes later in life, which is probably where you are now, when you really ought to be flourishing and your brain is still on survival strategy. That's the problem. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in the future. But for now, let's start to understand the patterns that emerge as we start to learn how to survive our childhood. So let's go back to these two choices. And the two choices uh, can be summed up like this. First of all, what I call the addict choice. Now, this is basically the selfish choice and it can be summed up this way or philosophy of it can be summed up this way that if only I get everything I want then everything will work out. It's a sense of I can produce my security and my safety by just thinking about me so that I can shut everyone else out, I can create this kind of selfish bubble and say as long as I get everything I want probably my life will work out. Now, that is the selfish alter, uh, um, option. Um, but it's not the only one. The mirror pattern, the alternative to that, is what we might call the selfless option. Now, the selfless option can be summed up in this type of philosophy. If everyone else gets what they want, then probably things will work out. So, this is very, uh, what you might call the selfless. Now, this is the reverse addict. If the other one's the addict, this is the reverse addict. It's just like addiction, but everything's turned on its head. Now, very confusing, especially when you're first introduced to the idea of codependence and, and, and reverse addiction, because addiction already turns everything on its head. And when we say reverse addiction is even more um, chaotic, if you like, in terms of the structure of your life because it starts out with an imitation. Now, the selfish stuff is an imitation as well. It's an, because in some ways, selfish people, particularly young people, they can look quite grown up when they're behaving selfishly. They can be very driven. They can be very single-minded. So they can do things like pass exams and you know, they can, they can uh, look successful. Uh, it's all an imitation. Same with the uh, reverse addict. In the selfless option, they uh, can look quite spiritual, you know, because they're forever concerned with others. They're forever knocking themselves out to help others. Even when they should be putting themselves first, they don't. Uh, and so um, you get this, this well-defined difference. And although I'm describing, obviously, the classic cases here, um, uh, you know, you, you will see variations of this to some degree, but those are the classic descriptions. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that pattern in a family. Now, of course, if there's more than two siblings, um, then there's going to be complications to some degree. But I think if you uh, make that clear distinction between those two patterns, you'll cover most of the ground, especially when you're thinking of yourself and your own issues. Uh, we'll talk... Uh, in, in further videos about the symptoms of reverse addiction in different contexts and your own behavior. But for now, I just wanted to really get together the, the sort of description um, and, and how, it, how it works. Now, I call the reverse addict a pseudo-spiritual because just like the selfish option, uh, the selfless option is uh, an imitation. It looks grown up, but it isn't. It looks healthy, but it's not. It looks spiritual, but it's just as selfish as the other option. It's just a different way around. And so uh, the kind of things you'll tend to notice in your life is that uh, you, you resent people uh, because um, you're forever having to look after them, pick up after them. Uh, you feel that pressure all the time. You're likely to be attracted to addicts, to the other side of the fence. Um, and likely to be married to one or in a, an, a, 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 an intimate relationship with one um, where you'll feel deeply resentful, but 
um, you'll know who you are in that relationship because addict and reverse addict fit together like hand in glove um, but they fit together in the dysfunction now there's my alarm going off so that's 10 minutes so uh, I'll wrap this up now and say I hope that gives you a really basic description of the two uh, types now in the next video I'm going to go into uh, the scriptural and biblical basis for this um, and then we'll go on to talk about in a further video about the symptoms and what to do about it how you can help yourself so I'll see you in the next one